Hello everyone, welcome back to another video, and this is video number 8 in our series about packaging. Today we're going to be taking a look at failure analysis for IC packages. This is a very interesting topic, very important part of the of the manufacturing process, and, and uh, just very interesting overall. My name is Alonso, thanks for coming along, and I hope you guys enjoy the video. So, let's take a quick overlook, what is failure analysis? So, Failure analysis is an investigation of the conditions and failure mode of the chip after it fails. Um, basically, once the chip fails, you want to know how it fails and, and you want to know why it failed so that you can take corrective action. Uh, one of the most important things is to verify the failure and understand uh, the, the symptoms, which they're called failure mode, uh, understanding what went wrong, and then the next step is to find why it went wrong. Uh, this is the, probably the most important part of the of the process, which is finding the root cause. Uh, and thanks to finding this root cause, then you can then um, y you find this root cause with a series of tests and evaluations. And thanks to finding this root cause, then you can guide corrective action. Um, you can you can go back to the design board and try to to make a better chip that will resist. Uh, whatever went wrong in this in this chip that you already had in this prototype, um, and this is a very very critical part of the chip manufacturing process. Uh, you can't put a chip out there that's like half complete or that will fail after a year, and, and you didn't know about it. So this is a very important part of the process, uh, and and just make sure that the chips are resilient, they're reliable, and they're secure. And uh, it's also a very interesting part of the process. Lots of different technology goes into it, which we'll see in a moment. So how does failure analysis fit into the design process? Uh, basically, it's all one big loop. Uh, it's all interconnected. There's uh, lots of feedback loops, uh, lots of going back and forth between designing and testing and failure analysis, and they're all a little bit interconnected. Uh, but I'll try my best to explain a little bit how the, the flow goes. So basically, you start with the design and the s or the simulation. Uh, and, and this is where you get the concept and turn it into like a product based on the guidelines provided and this can be based on the need that the chip is serving or based on the requirements set by the customer but you always have some guidelines and and you turn those guidelines into a, a product now at first you get a prototype and then you start doing the testing um, some of the tests can only be doing during the the process and some of these examples can be like the wires you know the wires are inaccessible later on once you cover them with the package so testing the wires is something that can only be done uh, during the in-process testing and and some of these tests which we'll also mention later can be the wire pull test or the ball shear test and uh, they'll give you an idea of how resilient and how resistant your your chip can be from a from a physical standpoint mainly you can also do some electrical tests to to figure out um, if all the electrical components work as intended uh, and if they don't then that's where failure analysis comes in uh, they try to figure out what went wrong another thing that they do is with the failure analysis they'll do some accelerated cycling so basically they test the working conditions they test the um, the they accelerate the working environment of the chip to make sure that it's not going to fail in one two five years down the road and and they'll they'll do this cycling to test really the the resiliency of the of the chip and if it fails or when it fails they'll investigate the failure modes or like i said these would be the symptoms um and then from these failure modes they'll use a bunch of different tests and find the root cause for the failure and from there they'll provide feedback and it's back to the drawing board back to designing back to simulating and back to trying to fix these problems that have been found that probably didn't didn't know about before and this can be some kind of a uh, chemical reactions happening that you didn't know about this can be some uh, possible physical stress being applied in certain areas of the package and uh, these can cause s different types of failure modes and um, and they can affect the chip in different ways and we'll see those in just a second but uh, the main idea here is that the whole manufacturing process is a loop and it's it's not just one step after the other it's all interconnected and you have design you have prototypes 
testing, failure analysis, you change the materials, you change the layout, and, and you go back and test it again until you get a finished product. So what are some of the ways that uh, a chip can fail? A chip can fail in many ways, and I won't go into detail in all of them, but um, some of them, the, the main ones or some of the ones that we're looking at here would be dye and substrate cracking uh, when you apply uh, stress, maybe some CTE mismatch, um, or maybe the, the materials have gone brittle. There can be some cracking happening, uh, both in the dye and the substrate. And, and you know, this can happen with, like I said, a CT mismatch between the dye and the, the package or, you know, your TSVs if you have um, a, a silicon interposer. Different things can happen that can cause cracking. And obviously, it, it, the, this leads to a malfunction of the chip. It's not, it's not good. Some of the things that can happen are wire and ribbon bond failures. So these bonds can... Um, sometimes not not work very well this can be due to a lot of different reasons and this is one of the things that the bull shear tests will check for to make sure if the if the bonds are are made properly or or if they're weak you can have some planting issues as well where like the bonds not planted properly you can have some golden brittlement of the solder joints and create intermetallics and this is sometimes referred to as a purple plague because it, it has a, the, those intermetallics can have a bit of a purple tone to it and basically between the aluminum and the gold you can get some intermetallics which then make the the metal brittle and it's easier to to break it's easier to find cracks and it's something to to be on the lookout for and something that sometimes can cause issues you can have loose conductive particles uh, so sometimes inside the package you'll have a loose particle that's just like bouncing around and it can cause a shortcut or it can uh, maybe cause some damage to some of the parts inside um, and there's different ways to deal with these but uh, these can can cause some issues and, and often do you can have some um, moisture related failures as well and you can some of the things you can do is chemical corrosion you can have dendritic growth uh, leakage uh, lots of different things that come from the moisture but um, Usually, you don't want to have any moisture inside your package, and that's why a lot of packages will try to be as hermetic as possible, try to keep all of the water and moisture out, but it doesn't always happen. And sometimes, there can be some chemical reactions inside the chip that lead to uh, water being generated, which turns into, into moisture, and, and some of these failures can occur. You can also have uh, EOS, or electrical overstress, or ESD, or electrostatic discharge kind of failures. And these are very tricky because they're very hard to replicate. Uh, you know, especially electrostatic discharge uh, can sometimes burn the chip, and it's it's really hard to replicate because uh, obviously, you know, just a quick flash, just a quick electric discharge, um, it's very it's going to be very hard to replicate the same conditions. So these these type of failures can be very difficult to investigate. And uh, finally, uh, another type of failure that we can have is uh, plastic package failures, just your old school. Um, plastic failures, maybe some stress on the package and it just doesn't hold together. So what do we do with these failure modes? Well, there's testing methods to first of all find which testing, which failure mode occurred and then to determine what was the root cause of that of that failure mode. So first of all, once you acknowledge that the, the package has failed, uh, you first would start doing non-destructive methods uh, the reasons are obvious. If you first destroy the package, you might not be able to do some of these non-destructive methods first. Um, one key component of this is trying to determine the as-is condition uh, and verify the failure mode, knowing what failed and seeing exactly what the package looked like and, and what the conditions of the package were when it failed. And, and this is sometimes in order to try to replicate it, because if you're able to replicate a failure mode, you might be able to get more information from it as it happens. And non-destructive methods are always the first step of failure analysis. Uh, always try to find try to find where you can without altering the chip in any way. And some of the methods that uh, are used for this can be visual inspection, uh, just looking around the package and seeing that uh, it looks good. You can have... Uh, pinned or a particle impact noise detection test and this is like I, I mentioned earlier for the loose particles that you can have uh, this basically shakes the 
the the package around a little bit and can check for loose particles inside. And um, if there is a loose particle, then there's uh, a way to try to get rid of it to analyze it, and I'll I'll go over that a little bit later on. But um, it checks for loose particles. You can have some types of uh, spectroscopy, like X-rays or EDS, and uh, EDS is uh, X-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy, and this is a very common type of chemical ID tool, and it'll tell you the the components and the composition of your sample, and it'll give you uh, basically a, a different uh, different spikes of what uh, the densities or the the components of the um, of the sample are, and you can see what type of of composition the the sample is made out of. This can be very useful to detect whether some chemical reactions have happened or not. And X-ray can just help you find uh, uh, voids maybe in your in your conductors or uh, wires that are disconnected or or cracks things like that you can find through X-rays. And then finally we have some uh, microscopy and it can be optical or it can be scanning acoustic microscopy where they submerge the sample under water and they use sound waves to to get an image of the sample and, and these are all imaging methods that um, that will help you get a, a, a picture of what happened to the chip. So these are all the non non destructive methods and then once you've completed all of these are all the ones you would need you would move on to the destructive methods. So after all the non destructive tests are done you then open the encapsulant and look inside. It, you know, you've checked everything outside, you've done everything you could, and now you break into the encapsulant. And there's different ways of doing this. You, they they can like have different ways of cutting into the encapsulant, and also different test methods that will break the the package as you do it. Um, and an example for this will be the residual gas analysis or RGA test. And this test is meant to find the the it's one type it's a type of chemical chemical test and and it'll show as you guys can see here uh the encapsulant it'll it'll try to get the the gas from inside the the package and then we'll use that gas to to find you know they shoot um neutral molecules and they'll try to determine the the chemical uh, composition of the gases inside the 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 package and one interesting use for this method is like I said it just uh, what I was going to mention earlier about the loose particles because this test needs to poke a tiny hole into the package if you have a loose particle inside and you know you do thanks to the pin test then you can tape a little bit of a of stick a little bit of tape into the hole shake the package around a little bit and hopefully similar to when you try to get a pick outside of a guitar if you shake around the package, the particle will land on the tape and stay there, and then you'll be able to analyze it and see where it came from. Um, other type of destructive methods would be the wire pull test or the ball shear test, as uh, we've mentioned earlier. You know, they'll push and or pull until it, uh, the package fails, and that'll help them know how resistant, how resilient the package is. Or you can have some elect uh, electronic microscopy, like scanning electron microscopy or transmission electron microscopy. Both help you get an image. Um, and finally, you have some other tests like focused ion beam or FIB. Now, once you've already broken into the package, you can perform the non-destructive methods again, if you'd like, uh, on the inside of the, of the encapsulant. But obviously, you have to perform it on the outside first, then break into the package. So, there's different types of tests, and each type of test gives you different types of results. Uh, so mainly, you can get uh, an image to see some of the physical uh, conditions of the package, uh, to see cracks, see things like that, uh, if the wire's been disconnected, but they will give you an image. And, and these are some of the external visual inspection or internal visual inspection. You can have scanning electric microscopy, um, you can have uh, any kind of microsc microscopy that will give you an image and that will let you see maybe the cross section, you know, and see what happened here. You can see that there were some implantation defects or anything that will help you get across a, a, an image. And those will help you find all of the uh, physical defects. 
and then you can have uh, some kind of uh, a material or chemical tests that will give you the um, the composition of the of the of the sample. Uh, so the most common chemical ID test will be EDS, and it's used mainly for electronic components and uh, like I said, some kind of X-ray that gives you the distribution of of elements found in the sample. But you also have other tests like the OJ, uh, SIMS, XPS, or FTIR, which uses uh, Fourier transport series to to find the chemical composition of the of the sample. Now. How does all of this work for advanced packages? Well, advanced packages suffer some of the same failure modes, and they can use some of the similar uh, failure analysis methods, but they can be a lot harder to to perform because everything is so densely packed, especially in 3D applications. Um, it can be really hard to expose the it can be really hard to expose the failure location, and preparing the sample is very difficult. In addition, some of the image processing and segmentation can have less resolution, so overall performing failure analysis on advanced packages can be more can be a lot uh, harder, and and therefore some some other different methods can be used, uh, like for example, uh, there is a development in the use of simulations where they'll create a model of the package and and comparing the sample to the package will help them discover what happened, and they can also do some electrical characterization. So for example. Uh, sometimes they'll measure the resistance as part of a daisy chain, which uh, we can see over here, and they basically connect all the nodes in a way that they can find the the overall resistance. And if not, if it's not what they expected, or it's not where it should be, then they know that there's something going on, and it provides information about electrical faults uh, within the package that might be hard to see otherwise. And then there's also some kind of um, new technology that's under development, like for example, lock-in thermography or LIT. It's a method still in development, but it helps a lot with imaging complex multi-layer components for like 3D integration, or especially for things that are, uh, have a lot of layers that are densely packed. It can help detect the exact origin of the fault in a 3D system that might over otherwise be really hard to do. So these are some of the things that apply to advanced packaging, and some of these things will carry on into the future. So what do we think uh, failure analysis will look in the future? Well. We still need to develop a lot of the current technologies, and I'm going to go back to lock in thermography. It's still under development, and it's something that has a lot of potential for for advanced packaging and 3D packaging and things like that that have a lot of challenges. And it'd be interesting to push for more technologies like this that allow uh, for 3D integration and more dense, more density, a uh, higher density uh, packages, because that seems to to be where the package industry is going towards more density always. So. Uh, some of these technologies would be very interesting. And uh, also th in terms of simulations and physical models, uh, because if you have a simulation that creates models and then each of these models knows exactly what must have happened in order to to get to each of the situations. So you can compare your sample and you can, once you find the failure mode, you can compare your failure mode to all of the different scenarios from the simulation and that'll tell you exactly what must have happened in order to get there. So um, simulations seem to be a big component of uh, advanced packaging and seem to be one of the things going forward that would be the most useful in failure analysis. Um, so we'll see how the industry develops, but it's definitely something very interesting and worth looking into. So um, let's do a quick recap. Failure analysis, very key, very important key component of the manufacturing process. Uh, it's all tied up together. You go from design to testing to failure analysis and back to design to testing to design. It's all connected. You change uh, the materials, you change the design, the layout, um, you do prototypes, you get feedback, you find failures and, and little by little you start improving the, the package and you start improving the product until finally you get a finalized product. And this is all thanks to testing, failure analysis, and the way it's all interconnected. So in order to perform failure analysis, there's different types of testing, uh, which will show you uh, physical or chemical properties of the, um, of the sample, and this will help you find which type of failure mode you had, whether you had cracking, whether you had uh, moisture problems, corrosion, embrittlement, uh, all of these things 
are found thanks to all of these testing methods which can be either destructive or non-destructive so you will always do the non-destructive methods first then move on to the destructive methods collect a lot of information and once you know what failed and how it failed then you can go back to the drawing board and improve your product and that's why failure analysis is really important and why it's really interesting and honestly also a little bit fun <laughs> so yeah hope you like hope you guys enjoyed the video on failure analysis I thought it was a very interesting topic thanks for sticking to the very end um, if you haven't watched the rest of the videos I encourage you to do so on this packaging packaging series of videos and be on the lookout for future videos and with further ado uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one bye bye